the FBI is, is, is not been allowed to put Saudis on a terrorism list up until September 11th. They were not allowed to ask these people any questions. The President of the United States. The next week, George W. Bush finally threw down the gauntlet on global terror, or so it seemed. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. By then, the Bush administration knew that despite years of Saudi reassurance, 15 of the 19 hijackers had been Saudi nationals. So in the terrible aftermath of September 11th, surely it was now time to track down those who'd provided money and support for 9-11 wherever they might be, right? Wrong again, according to former CIA insider Robert Baer. When George W. Bush says, terrorists, those who harbor them, those who give support to them, are our enemies. That's obviously not true because everybody that financed September 11th is currently in Saudi Arabia and free. I mean, it would be sort of like if bin Laden had said, well, you know, it's just a coincidence my guys happen to run into your towers. Are we just going to leave him alone? In the past two years, the U.S. has relentlessly prosecuted its war on terror first invading Afghanistan, which unquestionably harbored and supported al-Qaeda, then occupying Iraq, which had virtually nothing to do with Osama bin Laden. But despite all their with us or against us rhetoric, the U.S. has given Saudi Arabia, which spawned the mastermind, the manpower, and the money for 9-11, a free pass. The CIA, for example, ignored intelligence about the hijackers gathered by a number of foreign countries before and after September 11th. The Fifth Estate has obtained documents, like these phone records from German intelligence, showing calls made by key members of the 9-11 plot to Saudi Arabia that the Americans chose not to pursue. And nowhere was that attitude more obvious than in the report of the congressional investigation into the September 11th attacks. The community made mistakes prior to September 11th. And the, the hearings on Capitol Hill began several months after 9-11. They were to be the definitive inquiry into what happened and why, focusing on what U.S. intelligence agencies knew or should have known. Eleanor Hill was the committee's chief investigator. In the fall of 1998, the intelligence community received information concerning a bin Laden plot involving aircraft. The much-anticipated report was more than 800 pages long. But since it was released this past summer, most of the attention has focused on 28 of those pages. One chapter that is almost completely redacted, ordered classified by the White House, and blacked out to the public. And because they're classified, I can't tell you what's in those uh, pages. I can tell you that the chapter deals with uh, information that our committees found in FBI and CIA files that was uh, very cons disturbing. It had to do with sources of foreign support for the hijackers or alleged sources of foreign support for the hijackers. Yeah. Now I know it is believed and has been reported that many of those 27 or 28 redacted pages deal with the Saudi relationship to the hijackers, mm -hmm. but... That's what the press has said. I haven't said that. <laughs> In fact, others familiar with those 28 blacked out pages confirm that much of the secret material about foreign support for the 9-11 hijackers does indeed deal with Saudi Arabia. What's more, some of the classified material also appears in unclassified areas of the report. In other words, if you know where to look, there's more than enough there to reveal exactly what it is the Bush administration would prefer the public doesn't know. So Eleanor Hill could tell us the story of a Saudi government employee based in California, a man named Omar al-Bayoumi. According to the report, at least one, the FBI's best source in San Diego, suggested Bayoumi may be a Saudi intelligence officer. You can then say that Mr. Bayoumi, according to the report, did certainly help and assist the hijackers, at least two of them. Those two 9-11 hijackers were Khalid al-Madar and Nawaf al-Hazmi. They were Saudis, too. 
and reportedly the first of the 19 hijackers to enter the U.S. Guess who was there to meet them? Basically, Mr. Bayoumi had uh, significant contacts with Midhar and Hazmi in California. He uh, put down the deposit for them on their apartment there. He threw a party for them. Help them enroll in flight them school. Help them enroll. And he tasked another individual to act as their translator, help them enroll in flight schools. Not only does the congressional report detail the Saudi support for those two hijackers, it also reveals how much American intelligence already knew about them by the time they got to San Diego. They'd been under surveillance at a high-level Al-Qaeda meeting abroad where U.S. agents certainly suspected they were planning future terror attacks. The CIA knew their names, birth dates, passport numbers. They knew one of them had a U.S. entry visa, which likely meant they'd planned to travel there. But despite it all, the CIA somehow neglected to warn other U.S. agencies about them, which meant that Al-Midar and Al-Hazmi were able to enter the country without a problem and settle in San Diego, even amazingly renew their U.S. visas so they could stay legally until they played their part on September the 11th. Congressional investigator Eleanor Hill says it was perhaps the single most crucial intelligence failure before 9-11. Had the FBI been told that and been aware of that um, back in January 2000, uh, things may have been very different. We had the FBI agent from San Diego who handled that informant testify in our closed hearing uh, that he believes that had he had that information from the CIA, he would have been able to stop this because he believes he would have had a, what he called a full court press in terms of investigation on Midhar and Hazmi while they were living in San Diego. But in fact, it wasn't until August 2001 that the two Saudis in San Diego were finally put on the U.S. watch list. By then, it was tragically too late. Three weeks afterwards, they crashed American Airlines Flight 77 into the Pentagon. He was terrific. He was terrific. He really knew how to enjoy his life. And he made the people around him enjoy their lives more. Elizabeth Alderman lost her son at the World Trade Center. Now she's among 4,000 Americans and Canadians who filed a trillion-dollar lawsuit against defendants that include Saudi charities, members of the royal family, and bin Ladens. The suit claims that by funding Osama bin Laden, they were just as responsible for the 9-11 tragedy as the hijackers. If this will cost the Saudis enough money, I think maybe they will think twice before they will sponsor terrorism again. I think that if we hadn't brought this lawsuit with the larger number of people that are involved in the lawsuit, that it would have taken a very long time for the name of Saudi Arabia to even be mentioned by our government. Elizabeth Alderman's life has changed in many ways. For one, she says, she's never been as suspicious of her government as she is now. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I certainly can understand why people would believe it, because it doesn't make sense. An awful lot of the way I look at life is things have to make sense. I may not be knowledgeable in a particular area, but I know when things don't make sense. So has all of this made any difference whatsoever in Washington? This past summer, U.S. Senators held a hearing on the financial support of terrorism. They asked government officials to provide the names of the Saudi charities and individuals who've been investigated for funding al-Qaeda. I know the chairman tried very hard and others have tried very hard to get this information, so let me try again. Okay. Are the names of those entities classified? The names classified that you have recommended for listing? It's a yes or no question. The names themselves are not classified. Then I think you ought to present them to us today. I don't have them with me. Mr. Newcomb, Senators were promised they'd get the names the next day. But overnight, the Bush administration classified them. That list, with the names of the Saudis suspected of financing Osama bin Laden, would not be made public, after all. Call it a conspiracy, or call it the way of the world, but the long relationship between the Bushes, the bin Ladens, and the Saudi royal family has shaped the times in which we live, before and after September 11th. For better, for worse, and for whom? You be the judge. 
Naturally, we wanted the Saudi perspective on all of this and tried repeatedly to get it, but we were turned down. The Bush family and the White House have also been silent on the subject. But there's a lot more information connected with our story on our website. So go to cbc.ca slash fifth and read on. I'm Bob McEwen for everyone here at the Fifth Estate. Thank you for watching. Good night.